Thanks. So as Rena said, so I've been working more at a, a sequence stratigraphic time scale, sort of the hundreds of thousands to uh, millions of, of, of years. So, uh, which means you have to sort of very much ab abstract some of the processes that are going on um, and all of the detailed process work into what's the long-term um, version of that. And so, as Irina said, I've been working on this with, particularly with, with Eric and, and Greg here, um, trying to build this into, into LandLab. And I've also been helped by David Olegon, who at the time was a Bronx High School of Science student to help me with Python programming. And he's now a, just finishing his freshman year at, at MIT. Uh, so the, the original, and, and I should say this project actually got its, its genesis the last time I came to the systems meeting and met with Eric and Greg, and we created a proposal uh, to work on an area in, uh, in Western Turkey. So uh, in Western Turkey, Wems is Arabia is hitting Turkey, which is, is moving out west, and then um, you have a subduction zone here that's pulling this way, and in here in this kink, what's happening is, is Turkey is undergoing north-south extension, so this ragged edge, western edge of Turkey, um, is a result of a north-south extension producing all these bays and promontories. Um, and, and the collaborators that I have in, in Izmir um, collected some beautiful high-resolution um, seismic data there, uh, where I hope you can, you can see where there are various sequences that we believe are the 100,000-year cycle uh, mapped out. And some of them, like if you follow this uh, teal one, you can see it going down due to the subsidence because there's a rift basin just out of the page here. Uh, but then it comes back up, and here's the clinoforms up on the shelf, and then it's dropping down. So the sequences have obviously been warped by the tectonics. And so, I mean, obviously this is subsiding, but is this part simply stable with other parts subsiding around it, or is this actively uplifting? This is certainly related to a transpressional fault across here, this is the location of the, of the line. Um, and so the idea was to uh, use sequence stratigraphic models to model the stratigraphy and try to back out the tectonics and uh, relative subsidence rates. And, um, you know, I previously, as part of Stratiform and Eurostratiform, created a, uh, a sequence stratigraphic uh, model that was the basis for this one. And it is, uh, uh, you know, uh, completely undergone bit rot. Um, you know, it was built with a, a GUI that no longer works on, on any modern computer. Um, Okay, but but some of the the basic stuff underlying it, you know, it it produced models that at least made pretty pictures, um, where you can see things like how the shore face is prograding with the sea level fall, as well as the depositional shelf edge, and you get interesting effects like, um, you know, even as sea level rises and the shoreline starts regressing, the depositional shelf edge can still be prograding you know, being driven by the sediments that are being eroded by the transgression. Um, the picture is, and it, and it, like many other um, models, can produce sort of the three main erosion surfaces that you see in stratigraphy. There's the subaerial erosion surface, which is the sequence boundary, but it also produces a, uh, a marine um, erosion surface that's usually mostly bypass, not very much erosion across the shelf when sea level falls, and, uh, and a uh, transgressive ravinement surface as the shoreline um, advances and erodes across the, the top of it. And we were able to use that in a, in a couple of places while it still worked. So in the Eel River on you know, sort of the tens to hundreds of thousand year time scale and, and some models and the millions year time scales. Uh, as I said it, you know, is 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 gone um, in terms of effectively able to run. And so the idea was to create this now within LandLab and take advantage of you know Python programming 
and uh, and all the capabilities that are built into Lamb Lab to hopefully make it easier to port it to something that's that's usable. Uh, now, Lamb Lab is generally a, a plan form based model. Um, I'm at the moment still doing a two dimensional cross section. So the way we do that in Lamb Lab is by making a grid that's a three by a large number. Um, and we set, very simply set the uh, closed boundaries on either side. So all the sediment has to simply uh, go through the, uh, the center line. So that's how we, um, we make it. And yeah, an advantage in Land Lab is I can simply tell it, these are closed boundaries, these are open boundaries. And it worries about all the boundary conditions and making sure that everything's correct at them um, and saves a lot of, of very painful time and effort in the programming. So here's, for instance, an, an example that's produced by the, uh, the modern uh, version where on this I've just covered, colored the fluvial shore face shelf and, and slope. And is done with a, a slightly asymmetric sinusoidal sea level curve where you can see the, the sh again, the shoreline prograding out. Uh, the shelf edge uh, moving back and forth, not quite in sync with the uh, with the shoreline. Um, in this, I'm still not completely happy with the algorithm I have for picking what the shelf edge is. It's not quite the easiest thing to to do simply. Um, and this is said that so this is a running with hundred thousand year cycles. So there there are actually uh, six thousand layers of sediment in in here that it's uh, kept track of through here. Um, I can also produce Wheeler diagrams. So this is looking at distance versus time, and the blue is showing you where there are sediments that are being produced with the darker colors being the thicker sediments, and the gray representing sediments that were deposited and then were subsequently eroded. Um, and the one on the right is, is similar, but, um, Unlike the older version, uh, we have now a very simple but working um, two lithologies. So we just have sand and mud. Um, uh, pro yeah, producing uh, a, a very a fairly simple variation in lithology across the model. Okay, here, for instance, is a model where instead of a, a relatively sinusoidal. I put in the oxygen isotope curve from Lysaki and Ramo, where I've just converted it to a um, directly to a, a sea level curve, even though I know there are temperature effects and it's not the actual sea level curve. And you can see now, whoops, um, that it you know has these tongues of of progradation that are being produced with each cycle because generally each cycle is asymmetric with a very slow, long, slow fall and a very rapid transgression. And so you get these long tongues that, that come out and all these little wiggles in the sea level curve are producing a lot of, produce a lot of back and forth within the uh, progradation with all these um, erosion surfaces that you may or may not be able to see from, uh, from a distance. And again, you can produce a uh, Wheeler diagrams um, between the shoreline and the and the shelf edge, with the shelf edge again not quite being in sync with the with the shoreline, but obviously a lot more a lot more complicated with all the variations in 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 sea level. Um, so the the basics of the model um, includes um, well the the big thing is is how to represent the sediment transport and deposition across the model, which I'll go into in a, uh, in a few minutes. Meanwhile, there are sediments coming in the uh, uh, landward side where you specify the volume of sediments, percentage of sand, and then um, that sediment influx can vary with, with sea level, for instance. Um, you read in subsidence through a file, sea level, either through a, a simple sinusoid or, or, or a file, and we have Flexural isostasy, um, compaction. We have the routines already exist 
uh, but we haven't connected it up. I was afraid to break the model before this meeting. Uh, because I'm sure once I do, there will be all kinds of things that will have to be repaired. Uh, and so there, it's still in a state of, 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 of flux where there's a few more things that we have to, you know, add in and adjust and debug. Uh, but I hopefully soon it will be, you know, publicly available through, uh, through uh, systems. So the input parameters come in through a YAML file which is uh, yet another mock-up language. Um, you know, so there are various sets that talk about um, how to time step through the model, uh, the shape of the grid, how to, where to output the file, which come out as net CDF files, you know, where to get the bathymetry and the sea level, the subsidence, various parameters for the sediment transport and the properties of the, of the sediments. Um, probably more, parameters will get added as time goes on. Um, so breaking this down, uh, that's for us, um, essentially on the coastal plain, I, I follow Chris Paola's um, long-term model of essentially a, a linear diffusion um, with, as you, you know, increase the river flow from uh, precipitation towards the coast, the diffusivity increases um, towards the coast, and you can you know, set a basin scale for how much. Um, and then I use Alan Nita Rotor's model for um, a nonlinear diffusion for the shelf. So the transportation on the in the marine regime is obviously some kind of nonlinear advection diffusion scheme. And um, the people like John Swenson used a more advective model. I've used a more diffusive model. Um, I think. Both of the models produce a lot of very similar things because I think a lot of the features that you see at the sequence stratigraphic scale are relatively robust relative to the details of the model. Uh, but this model does have some nice features that I'll show in, in a moment. Um, the you know failure on the slope, um, we haven't yet added in, um, but we'll probably add in some kind of simple scheme for for collapse of the slope when it when it gets too steep, um, and I'll show right now we have just a almost a more of a placeholder for, for the for the hemipelagic mud deposition that I really like to uh, improve, and I welcome anyone who wants to help me improve it to to join me in this. Um, so so onshore. I said it's simply um, a nonlinear diffusion with a, a linearly increasing diffusivity. When do I go? And and forgetting the uh, uh, lithology on shore, we, it's a um, this is a, a scheme that was produced by uh, uh, Juan Fideles and Chris Paola, uh, where essentially, as we we seen earlier today, um, you know, channels tend to accumulate the sands and grow faster than the floodplain. And so based on the model parameters, it calculates a, a channel belt aggregation and a floodplain aggregation relative to the mean uh, sedimentation rate. And, um, you know, and assuming that channels evolve when they become super elevated, um, it calculates then the number of evolutions per, per time skip um, to figure out how the sand and mud are distributed and calculates a, a sand, an average sand fraction. Um, you know, this is a two-dimensional model, so this is essentially averaging across this you know, width of the uh, uh, of the of the of the basin. Um, offshore, it's a uh, said it's a this nonlinear diffusion that uh, Alan Niederroder devised, where basically diffusivity is a function of both distance and and water depth. Um, with some, you know, with small terms that are added in to help keep things from blowing up near the near the shelf edge, um, and then I've added in an exponential decrease in the diffusivity um, below a wave base. Um, the, one of the nice things about this uh, essentially makes a, a dynamic diffusivity um, that varies as the as you prograde and and and, and regress. So what you find is that when the system is prograding, the shore faces tend to be taller and steeper. Um, 
when they're transgressing, they tend to be uh, shorter and, and flatter. And so when you transgress, you often just erode off the top of the shore face. And the lower shore face tends to be preserved and the upper shore face eroded, which you know, fits with what, what you see in a lot of outcrops. So I've been, so, you know, I don't know if there's a better schemes out there, but this certainly produces things that, that seem realistic to me. Um, and then that exponential decrease in diffusivity once we pass um, a, a wave base that you, that you set um, hinders the sediment transport and gives you this rollover of the uh, depositional shelf edge or the, the clinoforms or pro deltas or whatever you want to um, call them. Um, the only problem with the scheme as it's implemented is that then um, very little sediment goes past the clinoform. Um, and so the idea is that we will take the amount of, of mud coming out of the river mouth and use plume to calculate an initial distribution and then need some kind of advection diffusion scheme to distribute that properly. Um, and I could use some help from people who know about those kinds of, of processes. Right now as a placeholder, what we've done is just a, a simple scheme where um, the mud um, starts getting deposited from wave base and increases and then peters out as you go farther from shore, which makes a nice tail onto the, onto the system, but clearly could be you know, very much improved to produce something a lot more, more realistic. Um, so here's um, that same example again. And here's a, uh, just showing it in a, in a movie of sea level going up. So you can see sea level going down and the shelf prograding out in front of it. Um, when the shoreline turns around, you actually continue to go for a little bit and then, it, and then it comes back in. You can see the shelf is having gone back and going back and forth. Um, so this is just taking that, that file um, of the output of what the final stratigraphy, and since compaction isn't in here, I'm able to invert and calculate the stratigraphy at every, at every time step and, uh, and run through it. Um, you can see the, the sink in here that's due to flexure. Um, so we have flexural isostasy uh, where you can set the flexural rigidity, where if it's stiffer, the deflection from the weight of the sediments is broader. And if it's weaker, it tends to be uh, larger and more closely focused. This is a fairly low one. But one thing is at this time scale, flexure is not instantaneous, right? So, you know, at best it would um, go on at sort of a glacial isostatic uh, time scale, you know, of sort of thousands of, of years. But, you know, the, the actual GIA response is also wavelength dependent. So the time scale should be longer when you're going down to a basin scale instead of a instead of a you know ice sheet scale, um, and that has the potential to um, have have influence. And I think you know estimates of what the time scale should be is not very very good. So initially we put on the sediment load. Um, right now we we have nothing initially. You could put on, on uh, just a pure elastic load. Uh, deflection, which would be uh, relatively small, and then it, it sinks into it. And so like here's something where I have a relatively short time scale, which is what I've been using in most of my models. Um, but if, for instance, the response time becomes very long, becomes long um, comparable to the um, sea level cycle, then what happens is, you know, this is prograding out and the area behind here is still subsiding. You know, when, when sea level was up here and you were depositing up here, it wasn't um, getting the isostatic load. And so you can see more fluvial deposits being accumulated because it's subsiding after sea level has, after the shoreline has gone by. And you get sort of the opposite effect um, in here um, where it doesn't subside and then it's, um, it's subsiding during the transgression. And so it's getting more of, of deeper water faces instead of, instead of shelf. Um, so this is something where the, the response time and the, of the isostasy and sea level cycle can interact when they start getting close in, in time. 
here's a, a, another couple of experiments I did where this one is with constant, a constant sediment input. And on the top and bottom, I have ones where um, over here, sea level, uh, the sediment input decreases as sea level falls. So that might be something like in the Ganges Brahmaputra Delta where I'm working, where when the monsoon shuts off, uh, the sediment supply um, there probably de decreases by an order of magnitude. Um, and so, you know, um, there's more sediment at the, at the high sea level, and you can see the larger, more fluvial, and you can see the shore faces becoming thinner um, and much less of the, of the shelf because the, there's less sediment coming in then. Um, here's the opposite where um, sea level is, um, where sediment is increasing as sea level falls. It might be more of like a, a Mediterranean climate. Um, you know, and so we're seeing a lot less fluvial and a lot more, you know, sediment prograding things at the, at the low stand. Um, so again, that's a, a user, uh, a, a user-based parameter. And so here, Another movie. I can, there it is. Showing a, a 600,000 year run with, uh, you can follow the little bouncing red ball, uh, where you can see there's a lot of jiggling back and forth with the, uh, with all the twists and turns of the oxygen isotope curve. And you can see it, you know, coming in and you know, every time it tends to go back and forth, you can see lots of erosion surfaces and, and more complicated um, pattern of advance and retreat, you know, and bounce and, and back and forth. You can see the little tongue from the first part of stage seven versus the uh, main part of stage seven. Again, some, some kinks. Um, And then here comes the big final Holocene transgression across the whole thing. Uh, and so you can see again, these, these multiple tongues related to the long-term um, sea level curve. If I take the same model and run it, not with the uh, last 600,000 years, but 600,000 years, um, earlier in the, in the Pleistocene, when the 40K cycle was dominant, I get something like this, uh, where it's lots of very fast patterns and the, uh, not as much variation in sea level, and you're tending to get much more vertically stacked fluvial um, shore and, and shelf deposits. Um, so I can actually... So here you can compare the two. You can see overall the, uh, um, over the last 600,000 years, sea level has on average been lower. And so the entire package is a little bit farther seaward in here. Um, and then for another um, variation, I did this. Um, these models are run with a fairly rapid subsidence so that these nice tongues of, of sea level are, are fairly, uh, uh, are, are visible and not, uh, well, you know, I'm off, offshore in New Jersey where, you know, there's almost no subsidence and a lot of them are just eroding and, and repeating each other and amalgamating. Um, so here's one where I, I cut down and got rid of the, uh, the shoreline and smoothed out the initial topography. And you can see over this uh, much more of an over, overall progradation of the system as it as it progrades across this this ramp, so there's, there's enough of a ramp to to give you um, this accumulation, but you can see the uh, the difference. In fact, I had to move the sea level curve to the other side because it was covering covering it. Um, in terms of of tectonics, um, we haven't yet started to model the the Gulf of Kusadesi. Um, field area. Um, I'm actually going there in, in, in two weeks to visit the area and collect uh, and get a, a, a Kingdom Suite version of the, of the project with all the interpreted seismic lines. Um, 
But meanwhile, I also in that area have been working in the Marmara Sea, uh, where uh, what we found is in this rift basin is that there's a, a series of, of beautiful prograding low stand deltas. And what happens is uh, most of the main rift basins are here, but there's an extra one here. And so this area here in the southern shelf is marine now, but during low stand, this becomes exposed and the rivers come and dump the sediment over this fault. Um, and so when that uh, jump over the fault is not too high, um, we've seen a bunch, uh, a series of low stand deltas prograding off during low stand and then it, it transgresses back. So I just tried making a model where I put that kind of uh, uh, backward subsidence in here to produce these tongues of, um, of, of shallow prograding shore face. It's, it's not yet tuned to, to match this, but was more of just a proof of concept to make sure that I can make it work. Um, I also, the, the Marmara Sea becomes disconnected from the world ocean when sea level fall, or the last time when the sea level fell below 85 meters and became a freshwater lake. So I cut off the sea level curve at, at 85 meters. So see these are a little bit flatter in front, but you can see these series of, of prograding uh, deltas, which um, when, we, when we collected this data was, um, you know, a, a, a really uh, useful discovery because that uh, gave us these nice 100,000 year timelines that we can tie and get age control over the stratigraphy within the entire uh, Marmara Sea. So the, uh, you know, anyway, the, you know, future plans is, you know, whoops, is, is now to, to go ahead and add compaction. Um, I also want to make some improvements to the ability to uh, change parameters during model run. So you can, you know, start a model, change parameters around and continue the, uh, continue the run. You know, for instance, in my field area, I don't know if that uplift, you know, perhaps started partway through the time period I'm, I'm looking through. You know, or if you know there's a river capture and sediment influx increases, you know, I want the ability to be able to to uh, pressing the wrong button, reason. And then I hope once we you know put in the last few extra things like this to uh, release it via CSD EMS and and GitHub and make it publicly available. Um, you know, on a slightly longer term, I, I'd love some help to improve the uh, the mud transport across the, the shelf and deeper water. So I want to add the, some kind of slope failure and, and simple turbidite. And I'd be happy if anyone else wants to volunteer to help join our group to you know, take part in, in uh, future uh, improvements. Um, on the longer term, we actually have a proposal to couple uh, Mark Person's uh, fluid flow uh, modeling through this so that as sea level fall, sea level changes go on, we can uh, pump um, um, fluids through the, through the system to look at uh, where there's um, both, you know, fresh and saline groundwater entrained in, 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 in the systems. Because for instance, off of New Jersey, um, there is fresh to brackish water up to 70 kilometers offshore in the sediments. In Bangladesh, where I do a lot of work, um, the Holocene section in, in the Southwest is, is primarily saline, um, but underneath in the Pleistocene, there is fresh groundwater. And so we'd like to try to adapt this to, to uh, model those, uh, those places. Um, I talked about this for, um, at Levant, and there was a, a suggestion, well, what about you know, coastal deposits? Can you get more detail in that? And perhaps in an estuarine you know, module or organic matter preservation. And um, you know, the, the system is written relatively modularly so that I hope you know, if people want to help develop new modules that we can plug them in relatively painlessly. Um, you know, and of course then, you know, perhaps down the road, if people want to you know, work on, on carbonates and, you know, Greg has certainly suggested 3D. I think 3D will be a lot 
bigger job and probably require a, you know, a whole new proposal to, to go that way. But, you know, Land Lab is inherently 3D. And so, you know, since it's built in Land Lab, um, it should be, you know, at least possible to turn this into a 3D, uh, 3D publicly available system. Because there are some 3D sequence stratigraphy models or models, but, um, you know, some are for shorter time and longer time ones, uh, a lot of them are proprietary. So, um, so I wanted to present, you know, where we are, you know, right now, and certainly welcome anybody who wants to come in and help us improve this um, or just wants to use it um, to, uh, yeah, talk to me later. Thank you. Thank you.